Let me read for you Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and you are of God's household. Friends, the song the choir just sang to us is, is true. If, you, if you're here and you know Jesus, even if you don't have any earthly family, even if you don't have earthly family, or if your earthly family is, is perhaps dis dysfunctional and you don't have good relationships with them, listen, you have family here. That's why you'll, you'll see me, friends, when we, when we talk about church here, the, the word, the phrase I'm going to use all the time is we're a faith family. We're a family that's united, not by our common blood type, but by our common faith in King Jesus, right? Amen. And so everybody belongs here. You might not have any other place that you belong, but you belong here. And that's not because of me, that's not because of anybody else sitting around you. We don't get to determine that God determines that by his grace. Right? And so let me encourage you, friends, be part of this family. Be a part of what God's doing here. So are you excited to hear from King Jesus this morning? Mm -hmm. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 together. We're going to keep going in the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the things... My friends, that we have seen the last couple of weeks is that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he's not shy away from the hard topics, right? We, we talked a few weeks ago about sanctity of life, that each individual is made in the image of God, and as a result, each one of us in this room is immeasurably valuable. Every one of us has great value because God has stamped us with something that he hasn't stamped the rest of creation with, and as a result... We don't determine when someone's life ends, right? That's, that's what he gets at when he talks about murder and hatred in the Sermon on the Mount. And that includes, let me just remind you, because I had to be reminded of this this week, this includes the people that really tick you off, right? When Kara and I were driving down to Wake Forest on Thursday, I don't know what happened, friends. It makes my blood boil just thinking about it. Everybody on the road wanted to drive seven to eight miles under the speed limit, and it just makes me crazy, okay? I have a road rage problem, and it's important for me to be reminded of these truths as well, right? Even the people who get under our skin and drive us nuts, and sometimes we do that to each other, right? We're all made in God's image, though, right? We all have the measurable value. And last week, we saw that Jesus didn't shy away from the topic of lust and adultery, and remember, the, the reality is he's getting at the heart. He's trying to remind us that obedience isn't just about what we say or what we do. It's not about our actions, it's about our hearts. And so you can be obeying on the outside while still being disobedient and missing the mark on the inside with our hearts. And so Jesus is trying to remind us, come back to the heart. And this morning, we're going to see Jesus do the same thing with the topic of marriage and divorce and remarriage. And so look with me. In verse 31 of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says this. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So let's pray. We need God's grace as we study this one, friends. So let's Ask God to teach us this morning. Father, we, we come to a very tough passage this morning. Not just tough because the, the truths might be hard for us to hear this morning, but you know, God, that this is a tough couple of verses for us to interpret and understand well. And so we need your grace as we examine these words, as we look at Scripture, God, this morning, the, the Scripture that is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. God, the, the scripture that never fails to accomplish the purpose for which you sent it out. Your word is, is perfect, it is clear, it is right, and it is good, and it is for our good. And so God, would you help us wrap our heads around what you have to teach us this morning, and more importantly, would you help us wrap our hearts around what you have to teach us? Because God, you know better than I do, we live in a culture and in a country that is really confused on the topic of marriage. <coughs> Because we've, we've pushed away your word in our country. And as a result, our society is so confused about what marriage is and why marriage matters. And so would you help us, remind us of why marriage matters so much to you this morning. 
It may have mattered more to us by the time we leave. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 There was a, a story in the news just this week. I uh, saw this on a couple of news outlets. There's a, a nursing home in Wisconsin. And a couple of the staff members at this nursing home in, in Wisconsin, they, they decided they wanted to do this really fun activity for all of the people that were at the nursing home and their families as they would come in to visit. So they got the world's largest puzzle. 60,000 pieces. How, where, where are my puzzle people in the, in the room this morning? Okay, I don't understand any of you, but whatever makes you happy, right? Now, this puzzle is really unique because it comes in 60 sections. There's actually 60 smaller puzzles that are each 1,000 pieces each, and they all make their own picture, but you can put them all together and have this one enormous 60,000 piece puzzle and friends they've been working on this thing for quite some time and it's gotten quite a stir in the community because a couple of weeks ago they were nearing the end and they were working on these puzzles and you guys know the feeling when you've worked on a puzzle for a while and you get near the finish line you just get this extra drive you want to get it done and see the final project and feel the the enjoyment of, of accomplishing this puzzle so they get to the last few pieces, and they figure out where they go, and literally, this is a true story, they found out the worst nightmare of every person who's ever had a puzzle. Guess how many pieces were missing? One. One piece. 60,000 pieces, and they put together 59,999 pieces. They are missing one piece of this puzzle. Would have been a Guinness World Record, but it's not a complete puzzle. Would have, would have set the all-time record, but they didn't actually get it done because they were missing one piece. And I don't know about you, friends. I have the personality. I would have been taking a sledgehammer to the walls. Like, where is this piece, right? Check your pockets, people. We're going to have to frisk you. I don't, I don't care. We need this piece, right? So, so these, these people are stuck missing one piece of the puzzle. Now... What's the most important piece of that puzzle right now to them? Missing. It's the piece they're missing, right? They've got all the other ones. They're all in their place, but do they have a complete puzzle? No, they're missing one piece. And if you were to ask them, they would say they're missing the most important piece. It's the piece they can't locate. And friends, that's what Jesus is doing for us again in the Sermon on the Mount. He's reminding us that a life of righteousness, a life of obedience, a life that's glorifying to God, we can have all of the pieces of the puzzle in place, but if we're missing the one most important piece, we're missing it all. The puzzle's not complete. And the most important piece that Jesus keeps coming back to is the heart. He says you, you can live a, a, a good life, you can live a moral life, but if you're missing the heart, you're missing it all. The puzzle's not complete. You can go to church and Sunday school every Sunday, but if, you, if you're missing the heart, you're missing the most important piece. You can, you can give in the tithes and offerings, you can serve, you can be a devoted person, but if you're missing the heart, we're missing what God cares most about, because while man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. It's your heart that he cares about most. And friends, here's, here's the reality. When we come to a passage like this, most people want to make this passage about the subject that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about marriage and divorce and remarriage. But the reality is, that's just the illustration Jesus is using. Just like I just told you a puzzle illustration to make a point, Jesus is using marriage, divorce, and remarriage to make a point for us. And the point is, it's about the heart. We'll see that this morning. But at the same time, I understand that this particular topic, especially in our culture today, brings up a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions in the room, because some of us, many of us, perhaps have been impacted by divorce. Whether you have gone through a divorce or whether your parents divorced or a sibling has gone through a, a difficult divorce, whatever the case might be, most of us at least know someone who has been divorced and Many of us can recall the pain and the heartache that comes along with that. And so, friends, what I want to remind us of today is that we're, 
the, the passage we're talking about, Jesus is making a point that's not about marriage and divorce and remarriage. He's coming back to the heart. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. But in two weeks, after I get back from the youth conference, I do want to pause and talk about what the gospel says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, because this is such an important topic in our culture today. And I want to guide us through God's word as to say, here's what God has to teach us on these subjects. Because these are questions that many of us have. What is what is okay? And I will, I will just answer this one question. A lot of people ask, is it okay to get a divorce? Well, God does make an allowance for divorces. He permits divorces under two specific scenarios. One of them he mentions here, and it's adultery. And the other one you can find in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If a believer is married to an unbeliever and the <coughs> unbeliever wants to leave the marriage, the believer is allowed to say, yes, I'll let you go. Those are the two cases in which divorce is permitted by God. It's never commanded, it's never required for you to divorce, but God does allow it under certain circumstances. But let's be clear, friends, it's not that simple of a conversation, right? And I want to I be clear this morning, we're talking about a subject that it's easy for us to make it about just getting the right answers and forget that there are people's lives that are, that are impacted by subjects like these. And so when we talk about the heart behind marriage this morning, friends, you might find that we talk about subjects that, that maybe step on your toes a little bit. And I want you to understand that all week, well, I have been praying for your hearts and for my heart that God would, God would teach us truth, but in a way that reminds us that there's grace. And in a way that reminds us that God is good and God is Quick to forgive, like Rick was talking about with the children's sermon this morning. Now, why does, why does this matter? Well, here's the first thing you can write down in your bulletin if you're taking notes. Why is, why is Jesus coming back to the heart of marriage? Well, the first thing we can learn, and we're going to turn there in a little bit, is that God designed marriage. God designed marriage. God came up with the idea, okay? And what God's getting at here is when, when we're talking about, you know, whoever commits uh, or, sorry, whoever divorces his wife, let, let her give her a certificate of divorce. And whoever marries a woman who has been divorced commits adultery. What Jesus is really getting at, the idea of what Jesus is saying in here is they devalued marriage. Because what they were doing in Jesus' day is the scribes and the Pharisees said, well, you can get a divorce for just about any reason whatsoever. So the Bible gives us two reasons. I shared those with you a minute ago, but the religious leaders of Jesus' day came up with just about every excuse in the book for a divorce. In fact, there was one religious teacher who famously taught that if the wife consistently overcooked the food, the man had the right to divorce. <laughs> right? She just screwed up the meatloaf, and you can kick her out of the house. Right? But they taught that. Now, now listen... What they taught was the important part is that you do the paperwork, give her the certificate. You have to file the paperwork. If you file the paperwork, then you're being obedient. And God says, look, it's, it's not about the paperwork, it's about the heart. There's, a, there's another one, um, and, and in this culture, remember, ladies, only the man could divorce the wife. Okay, so when I give examples using the man, that's, that's the reason for it. But another reason that they allowed for divorce is if you were married to... A woman whom you found to be too loud. Are there any loud ladies in the room this morning? Okay, men, keep your hands down, right? That's not, that's not for the men to answer. If you found the wife to be too loud, sorry, sweetheart, this isn't working out, right? You could do that as long as you handed her the paper. As long as you fill out the paperwork and give her the certificate, then you were being obedient. And Jesus is saying this. It's not about the paperwork, friends. It's not about whether you've got all of the to-do list figured out and you've checked all the boxes. The, the reality is you're missing the heart that marriage matters to God, and it matters to God because God designed it. And because God designed marriage, he alone has the right to define marriage. Okay? And I'm going to remind you again, the Supreme Court does not have the right to define what God came up with. Congress doesn't have the right, the president doesn't have the right, I don't have the right, and you don't have the right. God alone has the right to define marriage. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 2, to the very first marriage, and let's see how God designed marriage to work. So Genesis chapter 2, at the very beginning of the Bible, 
And this is something that kids are learning in Children's Church this morning. They're going through the six days of creation, and they're on day six of creation in Genesis chapter 1. And we know from Genesis chapter 1 that on day 6, God creates the climax of his creation. He creates mankind because we're made in his image. We're the, we're the highlight, we're the pinnacle of his creation. But in chapter 2, you read that Adam realizes that there's a guy lion and a girl lion. There's a guy sloth and a girl sloth. And God says, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And so God puts Adam to sleep, takes a rib, and fashions from that rib Eve. One Bible, college, Bible scholar called that the original bone of contention. The, the rib of Adam. I know that's a bad one. I'll just keep going. Okay. So let's take a look. Verse 21. We'll, we'll see it here. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The picture here, you can't really see it in English, but the picture here in Hebrew is this is like a wedding ceremony, and it's almost like God's walking Eve down the aisle. He brought her to the man. He's almost like playing the role of the father here. And so here comes, here comes Eve down the aisle. Now think about this for Eve, ladies. This is quite a day. Right? You've been created, and you're going to a wedding, and you're the bride. This is a pretty impressive day. And so God brings Eve to Adam, and the man said, here's his first words about this new helper, this new wife, this new companion of his. He says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. That doesn't sound very <coughs> romantic, right? Now, it doesn't sound romantic in English, so guys, I would not, I would not write a Valentine's card with this verse on it, okay? This is not a great pickup line. <laughs> now, in the Hebrew language, in the original language, this is, actually, this is actually love poetry. He comes up with a poem on the spot, and it's very, very romantic. Basically, what he's saying is, you're bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, you complete me. You, you, are, you are basically one with me already because God took you out of me. And I am absolutely overjoyed. It would be as if he was jumping up and down, excited. I can't believe I have a helper. I have a wife. And friends, this is how God wants us to think about marriage. I can't believe God has blessed me with somebody to go through life with. Amen? This is a good thing we're talking about. Verse 24, and here's some realities that God tells us about marriage. He says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Okay, so here's, here's the reality. There's a couple of steps here. The man needs to leave his father and mother, right? So, so there's, a, there's a leaving of, of the parents that needs to happen here. And then he's joined to his wife, and they become one flesh. And so this is marriage in the Bible. It's between one man and one woman. And the idea is they become one. They, they become united so much that it's as if they're one person. They become united so much that it's as if they're one person. Now... This matters to God because not only has he created marriage, and not only does he get to define marriage, but he actually created marriage to be an illustration for the world. So again, a few minutes ago, I gave you an illustration about a puzzle. But if somebody was to ask you, what did Ben preach about in church this morning? If you said, well, he, he talked about a puzzle, would you really be getting the point? No, because the sermon's not about a puzzle. The puzzle's just an illustration that makes the point, right? Well, in the same way, friends, God's designed marriage to be a beautiful illustration just like that puzzle. And he tells us about that in Ephesians chapter 5. So now we're going to flip into the New Testament to Ephesians chapter 5. So why does marriage matter so much in the sight of God? Take a look at Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 31, where Paul is going to quote what we just read in Genesis chapter 2. Look at it with me, verse 31. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. We just read that verse. Keep looking with me. Verse 32. The mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to who? Christ and the 
and the church. So here's the reality, friends. Don't miss this. Marriage matters to God because it's not just about you and your spouse. It's not just about that. Listen, our marriages, friends, are designed to be a tangible illustration for the world around us so that they can see how the relationship between Jesus and the church is ultimately meant to function. And so that's why he says here in verse 33, nevertheless, each individual among you is to love his own wife as himself. Did Jesus love the church as himself? Yes. And the wife must see it to it that she respects her husband. Is the church to respect and to honor and to follow Jesus? Yes. And so the picture here is this. Guys, we have a massive weight of responsibility on our shoulders. We are to love our wives in such a way that the world can look at our selfless, sacrificial love and they can see something of the love of Jesus towards his people. I mean, think about that. And, and, and guys, I'm going to tell you this. The way you treat your wife will tell the world something about what they should think about Jesus. So if you talk down to your wife, what you're telling this world is that Jesus talks down to his people. When you are short and impatient with your wife, what you're telling the world is that that's, that's what you think Jesus is to his people. When you don't have time for your wife because you're out busy working to make an extra buck, what you're telling this world is that Jesus doesn't have time for his people. And friends, I am a very perfect husband. You guys know that. But I want to remind us this morning, based on the authority of the word of God, that guys, we have a massive responsibility. And only by God's grace can we paint a clear picture for this world of how much Jesus loves the church. Now, you might think to yourself, wait a minute, Ben, I'm married to someone who's hard to love. Don't say that. But you might be thinking, okay? <laughs> now, let me remind you. Are you and I hard to love? Is the church hard to love? Okay, so, so, so let me remind you, friends, Jesus doesn't love us because we're these awesome, amazing, wonderful, lovable people. He loves us even when we're unlovable, okay? So, friends, I want to remind you, especially guys in the room here, if you're married, you have a wife, let me, let me remind you, this command to love your wife, it doesn't just go for her good days, okay? This includes the bad days, too. This includes the hard times. This includes when she's just in a bad mood. Because Jesus loves us even on our bad days. Now that's the guys. What about the ladies? Didn't think you'd get off the hook, did you? <laughs> ladies, listen. The way you treat your husband tells this world something about what we think of Jesus and how we should respond to Jesus. And so ladies, if you consistently put down your husband... In front of other people, what you're saying is we should be putting down Jesus in front of other people too. He's not that worthy of talking about. Now, I'm not saying your husband is Jesus. Don't get me wrong here. But what I'm saying is there's a picture that we're painting. There's an illustration that we are living out for this world. And how we live it out says something to the world about the gospel. And so, ladies, if, if you consistently nag your husband... Sometimes I know it's the only way to get us to do things, okay? We're slow. But if you consistently nag your husband in a way that puts down your husband, what you're saying is we, we need to nag Jesus because that's the only way we're going to get through to him. If you consistently resist your husband's affections towards you, then what you're saying is we should resist Jesus' affections. Friends, I want to remind us this morning, this is a massive deal because it's not just about us and our happiness. And that's where the scribes and the Pharisees have missed the boat, friends. They had thought, well, this lady's too loud, I want to try a new one. She overcooked the chicken, here's your certificate, lady, because I don't, I, I, my happiness is most important. I want a quiet lady who cooks good meals. And mine's her business. Now, we laugh about that, friends, but listen, is our world today any different? What's the common line? This isn't working out anymore. For who? I'm not, I'm not in love with you anymore. 
As if love's a feeling and not a choice that we make. Listen, friends, I want to remind us, marriage is not about you and I. It's not about our happiness. It's about our holiness. It's about a picture that we're painting for this world, about how beautiful Jesus is and what he's done for his church. So do you think this matters to God? Of course this matters to God. Because the only way, in many cases, that the world is going to see the gospel clearly lived out is in our marriages. Note this, Jesus doesn't design the church as an illustration here. Jesus designs marriage as the illustration. It comes back to the family. So the way we love our wives and respect our husbands, this points the world to a picture that's bigger than any of us. And the people of the, the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders, they had made it about a piece of paper. And friends, in our culture, we have made marriage nothing more than a piece of paper, too. And what Jesus is reminding us is it's about the heart. We have devalued marriage. We have made marriage not a big deal. And God says this is a massive deal. It's a massive deal. You know, my daughter, uh, my, my daughter loves learning words and animals right now. Our, uh, <clears throat> rather particular a delight of hers. She loves pictures of animals and saying their names and all of those things. And she often asks me, Daddy, can you draw an animal? Right? So she'll just call out an animal name. She'll say duck, and I have to draw a duck. And cow, and I have to draw a cow. Now, how many of you are good at drawing? Nobody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> me too. So when my daughter asks me to draw a duck, don't judge me too much here. That's about what I come up with. <laughs> that's about how good I do. That's good? You have low standards, Dan. You have the gift of encouragement or lying or both. That's an ugly that's an ugly duck. Now, now here's the reality, friends. My daughter's never actually seen a duck in person. All she knows, listen, all she knows to think of when she thinks of duck is what daddy draws her. Okay? She's never seen a duck. She's never touched a duck or held a duck. She's never played with a duck or fed a duck before. She's never interacted with a duck. Her only idea of what a duck is is an illustration that I'm drawing for her. Terrible. And friends, it, it humbles me to think that there are co-workers and family members and neighbors, people that we know, the only, the only idea they have of Jesus is from the illustration that we give them when we draw out marriage with our lives. Now, a duck's not a big deal. I mean, I hope my daughter could see a duck and know that it's a duck based on this drawing. It's debatable, but I hope she would be able to do it. My question for you, friends, is if there's somebody in your life who has no idea about the character of God and the love of Jesus, if there's somebody in your life who has no idea what church is really about, who has no idea about the gospel, could they look at the illustration you're drawing with your life and say, oh, that's what God looks like. That's what Jesus' love looks like. Oh, that's what it means to be the church, because I can see it in your marriage. See, what we're doing is we're just drawing a picture. But, but friends, this picture matters tremendously to God, and we can't cheapen this. So can I encourage you humbly with, with one final thing? Make it a point to invest in your marriage. Marriage is just not something you do until one of you dies. Okay? Marriage is not something that you just, great, you do the dishes and I do the, the trash and, you know, we'll take turns mowing the grass. That's not marriage. Marriage is, it's two people who are painting a beautiful picture to this world. About Jesus and his love and the church and our delight in him. So we don't devalue marriage. We don't miss the heart, friends. Now, in two weeks, 
what we're going to do is we're going to come back to this passage and we're going to ask a couple of questions that are commonly asked in our culture, like, is it okay to divorce? I answered that briefly. I'll show you more about that in two weeks. And is it ever okay to remarry when you're divorced? And what does that look like? And, and how, does, how does all of this play out in a world where we are fallen people? But in closing today, I want, to, I want to take you back to the passage I read at the very beginning of our time this morning. So if you go to Revelation chapter 19 with me, or I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Second to last chapter of the Bible. So Mary starts in the second chapter of the Bible. In the second to last chapter of the Bible, we see... Verse 2, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, made ready as a, what is the church? Where the bride of Christ, adorned for her husband. And how does her husband treat the bride? Well, verse 4, what we read earlier, he will wipe away every tear. There's no longer going to be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things that pass away. Can I remind you of something, friends? Listen, in eternity, there's only going to be one marriage. There's only going to be one, and it's going to be the beautiful marriage between Jesus and his people. Our marriages are not everlasting. They don't go into eternity. Only one marriage goes into eternity. The greatest marriage that we're a part of because we're a part of a church. So let's live out our marriages with our human spouses in such a way that clearly paints the picture of what Jesus has done for us and how much we love him and desire to follow him with our lives. Amen? We pray with you. Let's ask God to help us in this way. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have drawn us into this illustration. That marriage matters to you and it's a picture of Jesus and the church and the fact that we get to be a part of Showing this to the world is simply beyond us, God. It is, it is humbling and amazing. And we want to paint an accurate picture. We want to do this well, God. We don't want to, through our marriages, give a false or an imperfect representation of Jesus. To give a poor representation of how the church is to follow Jesus. And so, God, would you help us? Would you help the husbands in this room? God, would you help me to love my wife well? Would you help our husbands to love their wives selflessly and sacrificially, to lay down their lives for their wives? Day by day to put their needs ahead of their own. Day by day to serve and to love well, because Jesus day by day serves and loves us well. And would you help the wives in this room? to respect their husbands, and to follow their husbands' lead. Not because we're per perfect, Father, but because that's the way you've designed the church to follow the lead of Jesus. With this glad and joyful willingness to follow. And so would you help us with that? Help us to paint a clear picture to this world of, of who Jesus is and of what the gospel has done in all of our lives. Because this matters. And God, I pray today that we would walk out of here this morning with a higher view of marriage. Help us never to cheapen marriage because this is your good creation. You've designed it. You alone define it. God, you alone are the one who can keep us in right relationship with you in marriage. And through us, only you can paint this picture. So help us, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.